think about how ethics is tied to every single stage of the research process, right? So even if we start with identifying the problem, do you have the expertise to even study this thing, right? Are you, have, do you have any connection or are you a complete outsider? Not to say that a complete outsider can't study it, but a complete outsider is going to have a different frame of reference and how to do this than somebody who's part of the population that you're studying, right? So uh, what additional expertise will you need? Should you bring in somebody else as a co-PI? Should you bring in other researchers to kind of help you think through this? Uh, we got to evaluate the literature. Is there a need to continue this research or have we uh, fed a full horse, right? Is there a need to continue performing research? Is this still worth using human subjects for? Um, when we get to the design part, right? Research design and planning. It's like, what is our data collection method gonna be? Are we gonna do interviews? Are we gonna look at people's private diaries? Um, are we gonna follow them around in a car? Like, what are we gonna do? And is it the appropriate design to answer this question, right? Um, and probably one of the most important pieces of this is who should be on the team who collects the data, right? Especially if you are, if we think of those examples with um, those three populations of women, you know, they all had, you know, marginalization, they had marginalization and stigma kind of going for them. Uh, maybe a um, upper class Ivy League trained white guy is not the person to ask those questions, right? If we're really trying to figure out the dynamic between the researcher and the subject, we got to be more alert to that, right? Be more sensitive. So who should be on the team? When it comes to recruiting people into the study, right? The participants, the subjects, our sample. We really have to be clear about who is going to benefit from the research and are those the same people who are participating, right? Um, that Tuskegee one, the part that always gets me is they were the ones who bore the brunt of the research, but they actually were never gonna get the benefit, right? The penicillin was invented and available. They never got it, right? So that's always something that kind of bothers me, and it really comes down to this part. What kind of incentives and accommodations may be necessary? So one of the things um, uh, that really comes up is how do you get people to participate in your study, right? So um, sometimes you can give them an incentive like a meal or a gift card or something, uh, but then it's like the further, more marginalized the population you're trying to study, the incentives might have to be different, right? So different populations are going to need different incentives to get people to participate. Um, this is also part of, uh, you know, back with Tuskegee, they had that burial allotment, and I think it was like 50 bucks or something. But if you think of the time and how much $50 was worth, like that's an incredible amount of money for this population. So was it an incentive or was it coercive, right? That's the thing, we gotta think about that. Uh, when we're actually collecting our data, how are we doing informed consent? Those three populations of women that I talked about, all of them said, yeah, I signed the form, yeah, I read the thing, but I still felt pressure to participate, right? So some people, who especially who are coming from disempowered positions, are going to feel pressure to participate when maybe they don't really want to, okay? Um, and then what strategies will we utilize to ensure confidentiality? How are we gonna protect their identities? Also, how are we following uh, best practices for data handling and storage? Are we using appropriate techniques? Uh, a key point here is um, when we're sharing our information, right? We've done the study, we ran the data, we did all of this stuff. Um, how are we going to share the results? And will those results be available to the people who participated in the study, right? That's a thing that happens. That's a thing that often doesn't happen. Um, are the methods of our study clearly explained so that somebody else can replicate the study in a different population, right? Testing it in different places. So my point here is that we're talking about ethics too early, too soon, no, I'm sorry, those are the same thing, too early, too quick, too bureaucratically, when you know, we haven't even covered how to ask a research question, right? By the time we're talking about how to ask a research question, our discussion of ethics has kind of been over and done with by a week, right? So when we're trying to think about how to move forward and kind of how to change this, what we're suggesting is that um, DEI principles can actually help 
make us think about how ethics are tied to each stage of the research process. And then if we think of it that way, it might um, allow us to change the way we train our students in research ethics. So just very quick, I want to give you some very quick definitions of these terms so that you know kind of what we're talking about. And then when you think about how it can actually fit and address those research issues those, uh, in the design, you can kind of see how it fits together. So uh, the DEI principle, uh, diversity principle, D principle, diversity principle is about identifying um, difference, variation in our populations, variation in our research teams, <coughs> variation of experience of the people who are doing the study, right? Um, we're, uh, so many times, our research training tells us we need homogenous populations so we can make very clear conclusions. But, you know, that's how we got to 50th percentile crash test down, right? So uh, that's not diversity. So maybe we can expand diversity or at least think about how it fits into the study design. Equity is about striving for fairness, recognizing that different uh, people participate in the research for different reasons, uh, and, and to be aware of that, right? Um, in that, uh, study I spoke real briefly of, of um, the young women who were in South Africa, and it was uh, a study of an HIV intervention. Uh, what they found was uh, people were participating in the study because they thought it was going to provide them health care, mm -hmm. right? So they thought the benefit of the study was health care, but the study was about health care. The benefit was not going to give them health care, right? And so um, what that meant was when you had some people who thought that they were going to get health care, but then you had somebody else who wasn't selected for the study because they did not meet the uh, sampling criteria, then they're like, hey, well, what about me? Why don't I get this benefit, right? And so there's this equity issue, especially when you're working with disempowered or marginalized populations. We want fairness and we want um, everybody to be able to participate, right? even if that means providing a different or, or more elaborate incentive. And then finally, inclusion is really about just not excluding people from the study for reasons that we don't really have. Um, and so this is really about providing opportunity, integration. So this means bringing in uh, researchers from marginalized populations or from populations that kind of match the study that you're, match the group that you're studying, that kind of thing. So we can kind of move forward and see how they all fit into different pieces of our little research thing. Still me, right? Study. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> so diversity, uh, like I said, it's about variation and different kinds of groups of people. Uh, so when we're talking about research design specifically, it's about having people who hold different identities, perspectives, and trainings on the team, right? As the PI, as the data collectors, as the people who are working on the study. It also means choosing research questions relevant to the beneficiary community and relevant to historically excluded groups. Assembling teams intentionally to be representative of the beneficiary population. So we can see that you can kind of use this idea of variation, different experiences, different backgrounds, and kind of fit them into the research design model. Um, it also means, um, and especially in a place like Adams State, where we really focus on mentoring students and kind of uh, be student-centered as an institution, we could use DEI, or diversity specifically, to recruit, employ, and fund student scientists Right? Uh, would they also get to decide what is an important question to ask? What is something that is facing their community? Um, and also, they represent the population of the people we're studying. If we think of equity, again, it's this idea that not everybody starts from the same place. So this is about providing supports for people to either participate on the research team, meaning pay your students, right? or uh, you are providing different incentives for the participants who are studying in your research. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of an example here. Um, I once worked on a study when I was an undergraduate where we were interviewing, um, what's it called, uh, inmates at a correctional facility, people who had just been arrested within the last 24 hours, and it was a federal study, and we had this very strict protocol of questions we had to ask, and it was like, have you ever smoked cannabis? No, not even that. Have you ever ingested cannabis? And they would say yes, and then you'd ask all these questions. How much, how many, how much, how much did you pay, where did you get it? And it was like an inventory. Now their incentive to participate 
was a candy bar, right? Um, and so these, and so what they told us was, uh, you know, I was an undergrad, I didn't know any better. I was just, you know, trying to trying to have a job, and uh, they were like. You know, if you're, because these are folks who have been in jail for less than 24 hours, they still might be high, they might be coming down, they can't focus, whatever. And you know, when you're interviewing, they're there, they're there here, and you got the candy bar right here. And if they lose focus, they start wandering off, you're supposed to like, oh, not, not do that. Don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to like pick it up, do this, and move it to the other side of the table, right? To remind them what they're doing. Right, and so when I think of incentives and data collection options, right, they thought that that was an okay thing because they were like, well, they're coming down, they want the sugar, they'll do anything for the sugar, right? Or they can take the candy bar and go back into their cell and trade it for something, right? So it was like they had a good idea, <laughs> maybe, about how to incentivize people to participate, but also it wasn't necessarily very respectful. Right, um, it kind of uh, capitalized on somebody's vulnerable position, and so whenever we think of uh, incentives and data collection options, um, the idea is to increase the opportunity to participate, but not really in a way that is um, demoralizing or frankly, I mean that was insulting. <laughs> I always thought, but that's what they told us to do, and we were paid by how many complete interviews we got. So I definitely moved that candy bar from side to side to side. <laughs> to side, to side. <laughs> um, also one of those things about paying your students, like don't pay them, don't give them conditional payment like that, right? Not good research design. Um, finally, when we think about um, inclusion, it's about the idea that people can participate, but not necessarily just as a one-off thing. It's not like they're just coming to do the interview, report out, and leave. That they can sustain opposed to just doing the interview and bailing. We ensure sample recruitment and designs are representative of the population, and then we replicate it across into our research design is when we ask the question, when we think of who our sample is, when we're collecting our data, analyzing it, and reporting our findings. Inclusion fits into all of those things. Um, I also wanted to talk very briefly about um, like, like Dr. Albright said when we, be, when we were starting, like this, a lot of this is not new. Like we've talked about research ethics for a long time. We've really bureaucratized it. Uh, we are becoming more attuned into how DEI or, um, sorry, not DEI, um, justice and inclusion and respect for people can kind of uh, appear, right? Uh, as opposed to, it's not a bureaucratic thing, but if your respondents are feeling as though they are being insulted, then that's not good, right? So there is another research approach that is called uh, community-based participatory research, and it is a model of research that brings community people in, beneficiary population people in, into all parts of the design. So uh, the population gets to decide what the important question is, okay? Uh, that one study I was talking about with the young women um, in uh, South Africa for the HIV intervention program, they found, when they, when they were interviewing those young women, they were like, um, I don't know why you're asking us about HIV prevention. I need a job, we don't have enough food, and we've got a real security issue on our hands. You're talking to us about HIV prevention and it's not a priority for us at all, right? But if you have a Um, another thing that this approach does is when they have findings, they take it back to the community and they say, this is what I found, is this correct? Does this match your experience, right? Um, and I was uh, visiting with some counselor ed students last week and that was an approach they did, member checking. They had a write-up of their research and they took it to the people that they were interviewing and they were like, does this, am I getting this right? It does this jive with what your experience is, right? And when it was, then that kind of made a meaningful relationship between the community and the researcher. Um, 
So uh, just as, a, as a, uh, an example of this, the UNM Center for Participatory Research is a research kind of center that does this. Um, they are researching a program called ResWriters, and it is a substance abuse prevention program that is targeting um, young American Indian students, right? So 18 and younger. And uh, the way that they do it is they have, they, they kind of incorporate cultural beliefs, cultural iconography with uh, substance abuse prevention models to kind of uh, create a model that jives with the program. Um, and then the people from the uh, community were able to create a study that best evaluated it in a way that was meaningful. Okay. Um, all right, I think we're ready to wrap this up. All right, thank you. So yeah, so we just want to wrap up with a, with a few concluding remarks and then happy to take any questions or discussion. We're here from you about what you're doing uh, to ensure um, that you're teaching <clears throat> ethical practices of research, or maybe what you're experiencing in the classroom that you feel has, you've been shorted in your education for research. So um, <clears throat> we just want to um, talk just about a few concluding remarks. And I think, you know, combining these ethics, these ethical principles and DEI principles can really help us build a more robust understanding of justice. And it can actually lead <clears throat> to not just uh, more justice, but better findings and better outcomes because we're actually doing the research and doing and, and interpreting the data correctly when we take all of that into consideration. Not everybody can do CPPR. I tried it once. It's a lot, right? <laughs> we spent a year developing a research question. <laughs> and so it's a, it's a lengthy process, but, but it's important to remember um, that we need to be developing more strategies that incorporate these ideas in ways that we can use, not just in these long-term projects, but also in our practice of research on the regular basis. And so research ethics education, we, we believe, we're making a statement here, that it needs higher priority, we need to spend more time on it, <clears throat> and we need to align it with our instruction on elements of research design. We need to be talking about ethics at every stage <clears throat> of teaching research design. I think because there are these ethical questions, as Billy uh, showed us, uh, that show every stage of the research process. And in addition to the, what we give, the respect for persons, which I forgot I was going to do a little thing where I was like, which one of these three principles do we spend the most time on? Teaching. What do you spend the most time on? Anybody? Dr. Goldberg, what do you spend your most time on right now? Um, for ethics, yeah. uh, consent and confidentiality.